right, so uh, the disclaimer for those of you that have not seen the disclaimer on Facebook already. This is about military culture. It is America's finest at their finest. However, parts of military culture are offensive. So if you are not easily offended, you will be. And if you are easily offended, you most likely will be. Uh, the content here is not actually made to offend it. The point here is not shock value. It's not gotcha, it's not ah, he said what or she said, oh my god. No, that's not, the point here is to inform. Because for those of you that are going to go on and work with veterans, we're kind of a tough group. We're not always that easy. But if you can try to understand just a little bit of what we're going to have going on inside, uh, it might help you maybe give us a little bit of slack. So, America's finest at their finest. This is military culture. Now, I will tell you that it does have a slight Marine Corps bend to it because, well, my name is Matt Decker. I am a recovering Marine. No, I'm kidding. Um, I am a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, and it's six years with Bolt Fuel Charlie. I went to Iraq with Combat Logistics Regiment 15 in 2006, stayed until 2007. Uh, I have all 10 fingers, all 10 toes. Very excited about that. Uh, over there, my mission specifically was heavy equipment. It's called LAX. Basically, I'm AutoZone for Iraq. And so, in, in doing so, one of the things that I was labeled as was the platoon counselor. That was the platoon counselor. People were told, hey, you're going to cry, you go to Decker. And there's a reason for that that you'll learn here. Uh, and you know what? I didn't think anybody would, but Marines showed up. So my symptomology means I'm a social worker, licensed in the state of California. And here we go. All right, the goals of this class are to understand the military experience. Now, again, this is going to be a snapshot. This is not a down to the wire, down to the details, you're going to know everything. This is a snapshot. Small, and again, bring put that into it. Understanding military culture, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the offensive. Because sometimes we do that, and I explain in here why we do that. We also want to learn to engage in customs and courtesies. So for the purposes of this class, when we get to the section on customs and courtesies, you are all going to be required to participate in one. We tried one last year. It was, a, it was not an easy one. For If you've talked to the other DHV students that took it last year, the customer courtesy we attempted was not great, but this year should be much easier. We're going to start where everybody starts, boot camp or basic training. The idea here is we're looking to break people down. You sh I'm sure if you've ever talked to a veteran, you've heard, well, in boot camp, they break you down so that they can build you back up. That's true, mostly, but it's specific. Why do we want to bring people down? Because we want to destroy the eye. And when I was in boot camp, if you said eye, the drill instructor would walk up to you and poke you in the eye. And say, that's an eye. Destroy the you. There is no you. The you is a female sheep. It has nothing to do with an individual. We want to perform under stress. That's what all the yelling and the, and the hey, 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 and the commotion is about every time you see a docudrama on boot camp. We want to build the we and the us. Because we are good. Us is a matter of belonging. But we enhance them. Because they are always better. We are always better. So we're going to destroy the I and the you. We're going to learn to perform under pressure. And we're going to build up we and us and enhance them. Again, even between military units, they are a they and we are an us. It goes between branches, it goes between units within branches. It's us, and there's always something to, to differentiate between a military unit. It could be in the army, it used to be the green beret, it was different. Now everybody in the army has a beret, it's not always green, but, some, but everybody in the army has a beret. Uh, in the Marine Corps, it might be destined of something worn on the chest of a uniform or in a dress uniform. Everybody's kind of got their thing. Enhancing the them means I have this, or we have this, and they don't. And they will never be as good as us. Does everybody kind of track that? Yes. Yes? Okay. Uh, sir, this recruit requests permission to go to the head. Notice, bathroom, that's correct. Notice it doesn't say I. 
this was actually, I had a really tough time learning the third person speed when I was in boot camp. I was terrible at it. Uh, this recruit, because I am not me, I am not I, I am merely a recruit. And being merely a recruit, I really have no identity. The identity for me in basic training was Lima Company and that board, sorry, uh, yeah, Lima Company class 3119. That was, if anybody asks you who you were, you would say 3119 Lima Company. You didn't say, I am private that or what happened. You said, company, class number. That was it. Recruits are trained literally how to wake up, dress, shave, eat, talk, walk, you name it. We call it in the ring, we're learning by the numbers, and you'll hear that here in the video that we show shortly. They literally would say, put your left sock on your left foot right now. Now, how many people just wrap, around, wrap their head around the fact that there is no left sock for a left foot, especially not when everybody's got two socks? Weird, huh? So, a little confusing, increases the stress, we're gonna perform under pressure. We learn by the numbers by having the drill instructor count down as fast as he can so that we have to get a task done as fast as we can. Kind of like loading a magazine. Drop the magazine, run an ammo, drop the magazine, grab the magazine, load the magazine, slide the bolt forward, go. You need to have it down by the numbers. Fewer mistakes means more life saving. This is all designed to prepare them for war. Because in the military, that's what we do. We train to fight. Make sense? Boot camp basic training experiences, Marines do 13 weeks, the Army does 10 weeks, the U.S. Navy does 9 weeks, the U.S. Air Force does 8 weeks, and the Coast Guard does 8 weeks as well. All of this is more or less the exact uh, uh, same amount of skills with a longer duration of time. The Marines always say that their boot camp is the hardest, most absolutely the hardest one. Is that true? I don't know. I haven't been through any of the other boot camps. Here's what I do know. If I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps and immediately wanted to enlist in any one of these services, I would not have had to do boot camp ever again. But every one of these services would have had to do my boot camp again. And that's just policy. Yeah, true statement. All right, so Full Metal Jacket is historically accurate and a good representation of basic training. However, I know Facebook, you're thinking, oh my god, no, it's not. However, Historically accurate, this is not how it's done. However, for those of you that will eventually work with, let's say, Vietnam era veterans, this has reportedly been a pretty accurate representation. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that. There's Taylor. Hello, Taylor. I am a veteran sergeant, Art, your senior fellow department. From now on, you will speak only when you vote. And the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be said. Do you guys understand that? So, the point is, you 
I, I, as long as you guys go out and you serve vendors, you're going to hear quotes from that opening scene. It's extremely famous. Some of you probably have already heard quotes. Any of your, uh, any, any parents, veterans? Yeah. yeah. A couple of, yeah, a couple yeah. of dads. Any moms? Yeah, moms. Uh, see? That's awesome. Have you heard some of these quotes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're shaking their heads. You can't see them, but they're shaking their heads. Um, and not condoning them. I'm not saying anybody should swear that much, although, in the right mood, I swear exactly that much. I'm not, I'm not saying anybody should ever engage in that level of name calling or anything along those lines, but the fact of the matter is, is historically, 1960-something, that was pretty accurate. Even when I was in basic training, 2002, there was a lot of swearing. And I'll tell you, some of the names that they came up to call us were hilarious. Not when they're being yelled at you, but in hindsight, very funny. It's, it's, when you get to that point, it's, life gets very real very quickly. Alright, so this is primarily a Marine Corps ech echelon of training. This is combat school. This is what precedes, at least in the Marine Corps, Military Occupational Specialty School. They call, call it MOS school. You'll, you might hear a vet walk into another vet and say, hey, Army, what was your MOS? It means, what did you do for the military? For every civilian job, there is a military job. Veterinarian, there's a military job for it. Doctor, military job for it. Guy standing at the fuel station pumping, there's a job for it. Literally everything. Physicist, there's a job for it. It's like, that's definitely an officer. So, in the case of combat school, it focuses on the combat operations of the infantry, because in the Marine Corps, Every single Marine's first MOS is 0311, which is the line designation, the Marine Corps Infantry, pulling a trigger, right? Not the case for the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, or the Coast Guard, but in the Marine Corps, everybody's a trigger puller first. They call it every Marine a rifleman. Um, in this echelon, which lasts three weeks and is exclusive to non-infantry Marines, infantry Marines will go through a whole different MOS and that's the, uh, the infantry school is uh, SOI, School of Infantry, for the Marine Corps. Different echelon, much longer than three weeks, but for those, it takes nine support rates to keep one grunt, that means an infantryman, in the field. So for the nine of us, we do three weeks. Combat operations, ambushes, patrols, throwing grenades, machine guns, radio communications. And just remember, for those of you on Facebook that are veterans, you'll like this, there's always one guy in the platoon that accidentally throws the grenade directly at the wall in front of them. There's always one. I bet everybody on Facebook is going, yeah, I, I remember that guy. We're not sure where he went, but oh, he didn't last long. Safety precautions. So, the next one, like I said, MOS school, Military Occupational Specialty. And I already said, every job in the US military has a school, and there's a job for every civilian job in the military. School's very in length. Remember those gas pumpers? Hashtag Bolt Fuel Charlie. Love you guys. Uh, that was my unit. Bolt Fuel School is six weeks long. Nice, quick, and easy. Heavy equipment, that was me. 12 weeks, but not a great duty station. Fort Underwood, Missouri. God help us all. They called Fort Lost of Military linguists, up to two years of their enlistment, is military linguistics school. That's translations and uh, voice recognition, very intense. Each of the school varies on, on intensity based on either a, a psychological profile where it's a very, very intense academic program, or potentially, in the case of like military police, the school is like an extension of a boot camp. Because when you're a military police officer, you have a thing called a billet. That's basically a way of saying job. Billet can actually supersede rank. So for military police, they, the, uh, an E3, Lance Corporal, can pull over the base general for speeding on base. And he can issue the base general a ticket. Now, I wouldn't want to be that E3. I'd let the general go, because he will mess up my world later, I'm sure. But billet supersedes the rank. A first duty station. This is. You finish all of your training, and the military whisks you away to wherever they want you. Not wherever you want to go, wherever they want you. So you could be in Japan, Germany, Italy, England, 
Those all sound great, right? You could also be stationed at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. You don't want to be stationed there. You could be stationed in, name your, the state you like the least in this unit. You could be stationed there. Hazing. Military units have different traditions. Sometimes we call it hazing. Sometimes we don't call it hazing. However, hazing does occur, although it is expressly inappropriate and illegal based on the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But just like basic training, hazing is there to hopefully increase morale, break down the I, build the we, enhance the them. Because our unit is the best. We rock, they suck. That's how it's supposed to be. You are supposed to feel like the guys in your unit and the women in your unit are your family. First and foremost. Now it used to be that the military, you could get technically transferred every year. Not so much anymore. The military is trying to cut back on how often they do a change of station for people, especially when they actually need that person at that station. So today, in today's military, the first duty station could be a year, or it could be for the entire life of an enlistment. Four years. I've known people that have gone 8, 10, 12 years at one duty station. This is going to take a minute. Let's talk lingo. The military has a very, very specific lingo. And if it wasn't complicated enough, no two branches have the exact same lingo. Not even the Navy and the Marine Corps, because the Marine Corps is a branch of the Navy. So, I'm going to go over what I think is the most bizarre, because uh, any sailors in the room? Anybody that sails at all? Even, no, there's one. Okay, no, two. Okay, three. So, if you sail, either civilian or military, you will probably have heard some of these. Bathroom is head, the door is a hatch, the window is a porthole. Why? I have no idea. But that's what it's called. The wall is a bulkhead, the floor is the deck. Stairs are known as a ladder, hat is a cover, blouse, skivvies. A boat is not a boat. Don't call it a boat, it's a ship. An airplane is actually a bird. And if you live on a ship that has a bunch of birds on it, you could call it a bird farm. <laughs> it is, that's the aircraft here, bird farm. It's just a lingo term that some guys use, some guys don't. Uh, it's taught to me by a really salty, salty guy, uh, Navy, Vietnam era. And he called it a bird farm, and I said, what about the birds? I, I thought maybe there was an aviary on ship. I don't know. You never know. You never know with those guys. No, bird farm, aircraft carrier. Uh, by the way, you're going to mess this up. I did my time. I learned as much as, as anyone, and I still mess this up. Uh, dining room, chow hall, kitchen, galley, hallway, gangway. Yes. How many have ever, ever seen somebody on a movie yell, gangway, and everybody moves? It basically means clear the hallway. It means get out of my way, right? So when you yell gangway, it's referring to clear the hallway. Because if for all those of you that have been ever on a ship, even on one of those San Francisco tours, the, the, the gangway is very narrow. Everybody's got to plaster themselves up against the wall in order for anybody else to get through. So, you've got to get somewhere from point A to point B really quick. Y'all get it. Rumor is scuttlebutt. Um, explaining something in simple terms is called breaking it down Barney style. A couple of people know who Barney is, and some of you are staring at me blankly. Purple dinosaur, I love you, you love me. Yeah. By the way, a lot of Barney jokes in the military, too. Really? A receipt is a chip. Junk food is gee dunk or pokey bait. Now, I told you guys what grunt was, that's infantry. A po, a P-O-G, po, person other than grunt. I am a po. Pokey bait is junk food because as where the infantry feels, though they are the highest operators, they are going out and doing the job, and they have to stay in very good physical shape. They would like you to think that they don't eat pokey bait, but they do. I eat pokey bait on a regular basis. And if you had chips, you ate pokey bait. A uh, meeting is called a muster, and a food truck is called a roach coach. That one's really interchangeable. Questions on lingo? 
Anybody think, hey, I heard a military guy say this lingo one time and have a question about it? You'll get there when you guys, second semester, when you guys start working with the vets, you're all going to be like, he said this. What does it mean? Oh, okay. And then I'll have to explain it to you. <coughs> Customs and courtesies. All right. Now we get a little live practical application. So for those of you with dogs in the room, get ready. So, and also for the record, I am enlisted. I am not an officer. However, this piece of customs and courtesies is a lot easier to handle than what we did last year. So, when an officer comes into the room, someone, first person generally to see the officer, yells attention on deck. Can anybody else guess what happens next? Everyone stands. Everybody stands up. So, our custom and courtesy, don't worry, it's only going to be once, I promise. You'll then you'll have to resettle the dogs. Good luck. Facebook, you're going to hear some dogs barking, I guess. So, we're going to do a quick practice on this as soon as we're done with the slide. Passing by an officer. From enlisted to officer, officer renders a salute. A salute is not this. A salute is the hand in what we call the knife hand position. You will get knife handed in this class, by the way. Is to the edge of the eyebrow or the tip of the cover on the right side, whichever one, if you're not wearing a cover or you're wearing what we call the piss cover, which is the one that, never mind, that's inappropriate. <laughs> you come up to your eyebrow, and then you just cut sharp and hard directly down back into the position. You know, you render a, generally a greeting, good morning sir, good morning ma'am. Uh, lower level officers to higher enlisted officers render that same salute. If you work on, let's say, an air station, so Miramar, or where, anywhere where there are a lot of birds. Trust me, your hand's going to be in this position a lot. Travis Air Force Base, hold my hat. So many officers. So, officers are addressed as sir and ma'am. Enlisted are addressed as the rank, then their last name. My example is I was Sergeant Decker. Lower enlisted had to call me Sergeant Decker. If they were higher than me, they could just call me Decker. It's just about customs, courtesies, respect, good order, and discipline. Tracking? Okay. Alright, so officers enlisted do not eat together, they do not socialize together, they may not engage in any relationship outside of military order. However, service members break this rule all the time. We call this fraternization. Depending on the branch of service and actually the billet, like medical services, the boundaries are different. I didn't realize this was a thing actually until I got out. Because to me it was always officers enlisted, we don't play. But, when I worked on Travis Air Force Base, the officers and enlisted played a lot, because I was in with the medical services. Civilians, that's all of you. Interacting with military personnel, make sure to ask someone how they'd like to be addressed. Some of, some, you got an old uh, grumpy enlisted man, they're gonna say, don't call me sir, I work for you. I always recommend start with sir or ma'am. Can you go wrong? Sure, you might get corrected. But if you go with anything else, might be a sign of disrespect. So I recommend the server ma'am. And if they correct you, just say, oh, I apologize, how would you like to be addressed? Simple, easy, memorize it, love it. It's nice and easy. Um, all right, so we're gonna get a quick practice in for our customs and courtesies. Don't worry, this is only gonna happen during this class. This does not, this A does not need to, and should not happen in anybody else's classroom because the rest of your professors will hate me. <laughs> All right? So I'm gonna, we're gonna play this game. So, somebody sees me walk on, somebody says what? Attention on deck. Okay, good, well got it. All right, so, and then what does everybody else do? I'm gonna come into the room, I'm gonna issue you some form of greeting, generally it'll say, as you were, or carry on, and then you just take your seats and we continue on with the lectures. Everybody ready? Yep. Facebook, I expect you to do this too. All right, here we go. Attention on deck. You don't have to see <laughs> As you were. All right, we're gonna get faster at that, I promise. Some of those, so those of you with dogs, you're gonna have a little bit more grace period. Make sure that the dogs are good to go, they get settled. However, it's gonna be really, really great training for the dogs. Because everybody knows we need the dogs to settle, right? All right, so, generally speaking, again, let me reiterate, only for this class. We're gonna get up as fast as we can. I'm gonna try and get you guys back in your seats as fast as humanly possible. Why? Because we got work to do, all right? What? The 
dogs all stood for you too. I'm saying, yeah, even the dogs stood. Uh -huh. Some really good enlisted dogs here. <laughs> all right, uniforms. I want to talk about appearance. Now, let me be specific. This is not about talking about how you guys are dressed. This is a class. I want you to be mostly comfortable. I want you not to make you a little uncomfortable. No, I'm kidding. I want you to be comfortable. You need, you're going to spend a lot of time in your classes, so, but I do want to talk about this. Uniforms allow a service member to practice attention to detail. It also gives a service member a way to judge the person standing in front of them. I like the phrase, you look like 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. I, right, we like that, don't we? This means, and this is very generally speaking, it can mean more or less than this. It means you must be a bad person in general, don't care about yourself or anyone else, and will get the person next to you killed. Now that sounds extreme, doesn't it? It doesn't make a lot of sense, it's extreme. Here's why. Attention to detail means your gear is squared away. And when your gear is squared away, you can help other people. If your gear is not squared away, you have created a liability for your unit. Same thing goes for dog training. If you guys don't have, on your outings, the doggy first aid kit, the proper leash, your leash is unserviceable, something goes wrong, you haven't inspected your gear, aka the dogs, you become a liability, and in combat, liabilities get you killed. So, if you look like you're ready to fight, and kill, the enemy is less likely to attack. Now, how does this translate? Well, military veterans have a tendency to dress very intentionally. I fall into this category. Has anybody ever here seen me in shorts? Yes. Oh, okay, you don't chat. <laughs> Uh, no, you've never seen me in shorts. Uh, how about short sleeves? Again, you two don't count. Nope. You have? Oh, that's right. Yep, when I came back from a walk. It was very hot outside that day. This extra shirt was not going to happen. However, I dress for the way I intend to perform and the way I intend to be treated. So, generally speaking, you might see me in jeans once, maybe twice. But generally it's not going to happen. Dress like you came to fight, no little question. That's important. When you're working with veterans, you want to dress intentionally. You don't want to look like 10 pounds of shit in a 5 pound bag. Veterans aren't going to take you seriously. They want to see a pro. Because they are a pro. It's so important that uniforms are actually inspected prior to being considered for a promotion. If your uniforms aren't squared away, and if you aren't squared away, you're not going to get promoted. Now I know that some of Facebook is going to have to take umbrage with that. Air Force, this does not apply to you. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Let's talk about unofficial military traditions. There's a rivalry between the branches. It's right. It's not meant it's, it's really not to be offensive. If you are being insulted by somebody in the military, and you're in the military, it generally means we probably like you. It's a very hyper-masculine style of communication. So let's talk about it. Unofficial military traditions. Let's talk about reputation. Marines are supposed to be the toughest branch. Now, me at all of 5'7", I'm sure I am very intimidated. Hashtag sarcasm. But the fact is, we're only, we're only smart enough to be Marines. We're, we're, the reason they call us a jarhead is representative of the, the haircut that we have and the fact that our brain, our head, or our brain housing group, as we like to call it, is an empty jar, ready to be filled by the Marine Corps. Right? Navy are substantially weaker, but they're smarter because they operate those big ships and those bird farms. That takes a lot of skill to do. The Navy is a very, very skilled branch of service. Army. Not tough enough to be Marines, but only marginally smart. Call that one the big green machine. Very hard for the Army to get up and go. Marines are much more of a, of a lightning fast, first to, first to go, last to know kind of service. Air Force, reputation wise, is the smartest branch of service, and frankly, more of a career path than a branch of service. All, all of my friends that are in the Air Force, I love you all, you're very smart, but let's face it, it's a career. Coast Guard, 
is, I'm going to tell you, of the forgotten branch of the military. Yeah. Everybody forgets about the Coast Guard. But from my time counseling combat vets, I don't know a tougher group than the Coast Guard. Love me some Coasties. All right? Now let's talk about names. These are derogatory. They're offensive. Generally true. Marines, my ass rides in Navy equipment, sir. Very true. The Navy is the Marine Corps' taxi service. Navy, never again volunteer yourself. Very true. Army, sorry Army, aren't ready to be Marines yet. Now you can, now you notice, here's something you notice. The Marines, I'm sure, came up with this one. A-R-M-Y, we just left out the T and the B. We're like, man, we don't need it. To be great. Aren't ready to be Marines yet. Indicative of the fact that, you know, our intelligence levels, you know. The Air Force is actually the cheer force. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. And for my super tough Coast Guard, AKA Coasties, AKA Puddle Pirates. Why? Because they don't generally do deep sea Navy stuff. They do the Great Lakes and Coast Guard. Now, fun fact, the Coast Guard actually patrols anywhere along the coastline that the U.S. military is deployed. So when we invaded Kuwait, we guarded the coast. Coast Guard. When we did it again for Operation Iraqi Freedom and During Freedom, who guarded the coast? Coast Guard. Love me some coasties. Talk about the organizational structure, Department of Defense, as you can read. A term to encompass all branches, except the Coast Guard. The Department of Defense traditionally operates in combat operations outside the U.S. but can be utilized to support other government objectives. The VA, or Veterans Administration, that's benefits and health care. Anything to rate benefits or supply benefits is VA. Homeland Security encompasses all organizations whose mission it is to, in defense of the country within the borders of the U.S. does not include the CIA, if I'm not mistaken. However, Coast Guard falls under Homeland Security. Questions about that? I know it's a little weird. It's a lot of information. No? All right, let's talk about what we call the label of our veterans. So a veteran is generic. It's someone who served as a Armed Forces of the United States will receive one of several discharges. Generally speaking, if a person has received a dishonorable discharge, they do not rate veteran status. A military retired is someone who served an extended amount of time and earned the status of retired, generally 20 plus years. However, because there's always an exception in the military, just to make your lives harder, People that have been, or veterans that have been injured and can no longer serve, but through honorable service have earned a monetary and benefits retirement, are military retirement. A former service member is anybody that's ever been in. Whether they qualify for benefits or don't, whether they have a DD-14 or don't, they signed on the dotted line, they did a little bit of time at boot camp, former service member, generalized term, not all that sense. Okay, this is a piece we're going to stick on for a minute. I do want questions. Okay, this is called frontline humor, also known as gallows humor. Anybody know why it's called gallows? Hanging gallows, guillotine gallows, where people die. Gallows humor is hands down the one thing that makes more civilians stop serving the military than anything else in my experience. Because gallows humor is extremely offensive. We're going to go over it. However, it's super important. I can't even tell you how important it is for the psyche of the veteran. Here's why. The definition is a way to normalize behaviors and thought patterns that are usually unacceptable in civilian society. Are you guys going to go around killing a bunch of people? The military has a tendency to do that. They, they, it's in the pitch. They say, join the military. Go around the world, see new and exotic things, meet exotic, exciting new people, and then kill them. Gallows humor. An example of this is dead baby jokes, pedophile jokes, sexist jokes, racist jokes. I'm not condoning this behavior. All I'm going to tell you is that it's an important part of military culture because 
this type of humor increases and decreases based on the needs of the unit. A unit forward deployed to a combat zone is going to need more gallows humor, more frontline humor, than they will back in the States. Depending on the severity of combat operations, this will continue to increase until the level of trauma experience decreases. This is about normalizing behavior. We in the United States, we are taking your good boys and your good girls, ones that we've raised, we've taught them don't hit, play nice, don't be mean, and they feel a calling and they say, you know what, I want to go, sir. We spent 18 years grooming these kids to be good civilian members of society. And then they decide, I want to go serve my country. And because of what we're going to ask them to do, we turn the good boy, the good girl, the person that's been raised up 18 years to be a good, productive member of society. We teach them a level of skill that goes against everything they've already learned. We teach them to kill. We teach them to assist in killing. We generally don't teach them how to handle that. But gallows humor and frontline humor is a very, very important part of normalizing a behavior that the U.S. government has asked us to do, something that we spent 18 years grooming ourselves not to do to be me, to yell at the guy or girl that is a, a lower rank and say, hey, you messed this up. Let's face it, we're not going to say you messed this up. We're going to say you fucked this up. So you know what? Fix it. Or unfuck it. We can be. But that doesn't mean we necessarily are me. This level of communication, especially for those that have done 20 years, it's pretty hard to get out of. The fact of the matter is, is outside of this classroom, I swear like a sailor. The Marine Corps is still a department of the Navy, just remember. So, let's talk about types. Let's talk about Nile. Navy, I'm sorry. What do you get when you send 400 sailors out on deployment? 200 couples. Is it a sexist joke? Right? Is it a homophobic joke? I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying this is an example. This is very mild. Moderate. How do you fit 20 hajis in one sea bag? Use more grenades. Yeah. Is it racist? Yep. Yeah. No. Is it super insensitive? No. Yeah. Might it be necessary in combat operations to feel normal after you've just lobbed a grenade into a house? Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. How can we psychologically keep our warrior mentality and stay in a war zone with, frankly, without going nuts? And Gallows Humor is a way to do that. Severe, not even going to go there. There is no point. It just gets more and more offensive from there. However, uh, you're going to write a paper on Generation Kill. You'll hear severe in that. Again, I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying this joke should be told, told in public. Uh, I don't believe it is a good, effective way of communicating, but it is effective in the military. It does happen in the military, and when you guys go out to work with veterans, you're gonna hear it. I'm gonna beg your forgiveness now. You'll hear it with the vets that you're gonna work with in this room. It's just how it works. Not saying it's right, again. And if you do have an issue with it at some point, you should come and ask me. Uh, tell me that you found something offensive. Uh, if it's something we need to handle, we'll handle it together. Because it's a good experience. Any questions on frontline humor, gallows humor? Active Reserves National Guard. There are two types of service members. Reservists, and those that wish they were reservists. Still love my active duty, but reserves are the way to go. All right, active duty, 24-7. Every day, all day, for the length of their enlistment. Could be four years, could be six years, could be eight years. But they are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're blitz drunk at the bar, and you get a call? Guess where you're going? Cab, back to base. 2 a.m., you're dead asleep, you get a call. Guess where you're going? 
reporting in. Reservists. Generally speaking, all the same training, boot camp, combat school, MOS school, but they only report for one week in a month and two weeks in the summer. That's awesome. You get all that great training, and they report for one week in a month and two weeks in the summer. Spectacular. National Guard, same as reserves, but they report directly to the governor of a state. Weird, huh? Okay, they can be federalized though, which is why so many National Guard units have gone into Iraq and Afghanistan. So, there are some carve-outs, but we only have a certain amount of time, and if I go into all the carve-outs, we'll be here until tomorrow morning. So, Active duty, reservist, National Guard, your three big ones. You can have active duty that are supporting reservists. You can have active duty that are supporting National Guard. You can have full-time National Guard, but we're not going to get into it. Just know that there are carve-outs. Let's talk about the implications for family life with military culture. The military, 100%. 100%. Actually, 110%. It's not possible, but still. 100% of the time, the military comes first. There is no exception. None. Not the birth of your first child. Not God, as you can see on the slide. There is no exception. The military mission comes first, period. Yes? I heard my husband say the military is the oldest part of sisters. Sounds about right. If the military wanted you to have a spouse, they'd have issued you one. If the military wanted you to have kids, they'd have issued you to They issued them to you. Again, I'm not saying it's right, but it is true. I was once kept on station for well into the dinner hour on Father's Day. My mother made a call to the unit. Now, let me tell you something. That's something you never, in Marine Corps, you never want your mother <laughs> to call to your unit and be like, when is he coming home? I was very lucky that it did not near, end nearly as badly as it should have. God comes second. It's a close second. Very, very uh, specifically, they're not, the military is not going to infringe upon your right to religious practice. However, if it interferes with the military mission, guess what? The military always comes first. It's got military, got God. What comes next? Family. And let me tell you something. Family is not a close second. It's, it's like way down there. Family's third, not a close third. The military will only communicate, these are examples, they'll only communicate with one member of your family. If you're married, they're going to communicate with your wife. If you're not married, they're generally going to communicate with your mother or father. In my case, it was my mother. Very strong personality that Spouses are considered military dependents. This is going to be more lingo. We call them dependa, or dependipotamus, or the wives club. Again, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying I condone it. I'm just saying these are th some of the things, especially when you're working with the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, dependa and dependipotamus is kind of more of a new term. But dependa is just short for dependent. But you might hear, it. oh, are you dependent? Yeah. Oh. Historically, the military spouse carries the rank, especially for the Vietnam, Korea guys, their spouse carries their spouse's rank. So the spouse carries the rank of the military service member. So if you are a colonel's wife, you are the colonel's wife. And let me tell you something, there's a good chance that lower level spouses will more or less submit. However, it's kind of archaic and we don't generally practice this anymore. Used to be, when I joined, that if the colonel's daughter, who was 16, driving a very nice, relatively new Mercedes, drove on post, she got saluted by every enlisted on the sidewalk. You don't have to do that anymore. Thank God. I can't tell you how many 16-year-old girls I salute. Practice has changed over the years. We generally don't do it anymore. So dependents are dependents are dependents are dependents. Generally, the, C, the, wife's, the CO's wife will head up uh, a support group if the unit gets them. That's about really the only thing that I ever saw uh, happen for the last club. EAS, end of active service traditions. You're trained to be in the military. 
what happens when we're done. Oh, yeah, it's hard. At the end of a contract, a service member has 30 days to leave military housing. Facebook, forgive me, this may have changed. This was how it was when I was in. At the end of active service, your contract ends with 30 days to vacate the base. Losing base access means you can lose access to your support system and the family in the local area. There, there are some things that the military does to try and ease this. They will actually pay to move you home if that's your so choice. They'll actually pay to move you anywhere you want to go, one time. It's just a policy, why they work. Military personnel don't traditionally prepare to leave the military. We can leave penniless, or we can leave with six figures in our pocket, depending on how we lived while we were in. It's a nice idea to exit the military because literally while you're in the military, the military owns you. You no longer have a right to freedom of speech. You no longer have a lot of rights. However, you get out, it's like, hey, I'm officially my own person again. What a great, what a great idea. The other members of your unit might be jealous. They may not want to spend time with you. You're going to do this big transition and all of a sudden your friends don't want to spend time with you anymore. That can be tough. So, transitioning is tough. After being what, to, told what to do and how to live for several years, it can actually be hard to know what to do. For those of you that have been in school for a while, you're going to do one in schools no longer. If you spent four years at a traditional university, or three years here, or you're going on to the masters, you're going to do an additional, like, additional two, so a total of five or six. God help you. I have to go out into the workforce, I have to get a job, I have to fill in a resume. Oh man, wow, some of you look scared. It's alright, we'll help you. The university is very good about helping, helping students figure their stuff out before they end of active service here. It'll be fun. You'll enjoy it, I promise. How does someone survive as a, as a civilian? So I told you, they literally teach you how to eat, how to dress, walk, talk, the whole nine yards. How do you survive as a civilian? Anybody got any ideas? Try out by fire, on the job training, learn. Oh. We all know that's tough for Marines. Learning that is. Question? You can't. Hey, I still fold all of my undershirts the military way. Drives my wife nuts. I actually think she's watching on Facebook right now. She's probably like, man, I hated learning how to fold those shirts. It, it took a long time. It took a long time. Yeah, you, you just keep the tradition. If we had, you know, six more months, so I could teach you how to roll a skivvy roll, where you put your socks and your underwear and your undershirt all in one roll, and basically it's about this big. Yeah. Very efficient way of packing. It means you only need one skivvy roll per day. So how many skivvy rolls for a week? Seven. Done. Very efficient. But yes, uh, we are going to talk about the, that in the treatment lecture. Applying skills you learned in service to a civilian lifestyle. After getting out, the veterans have been gone for several years. Friends back home, they're not the same. They've changed. Or has the veteran changed? The veteran's opinion of his friends may have changed, or her friends may have changed. Long story short, no one trains to leave the military. We boot camp in, but we don't boot camp out. Depression, isolation, anxiety, this is known as adjustment disorder. Usually lasts 30 days to six months. So that after six months, we call it TSD. But this is tough stuff. So I want you to know there's no such thing as a stupid question. And if you don't ask the question that you have, you remain ignorant. If I don't know the answer, I will find the answer for you. So. Ignorance is a curable condition as long as education is administered. So ask me your questions. In the back. Is military retired under the category of veteran? Yes. Is 
military retired under the category of veteran? Yes. Military retired are veterans. What else? Okay. For administrative discharges, uh, can you get VA benefits? Depends on the administrative discharge. Uh, for those that can't get VA benefits, under mitigating circumstances, we generally recommend that they appeal their discharge to attain benefits. For example, a veteran might have been discharged under other than honorable conditions because after getting back from a war zone, he decided to slug his commanding officer because his commanding officer was being, let's go with disrespectful. It's good, good. So if it was uh, non, non honorable and then they discharged him, they would get the benefit. Other than honorable, we call it OTH. Um, you you don't, aren't precluded from all benefits, but you are precluded from some. If it's other than honorable, depending on the infraction that led to it, take a look at the VA. Whether it's granted to you, to that person, is up to the VA, basically. No. Yes, if they receive the education benefit, and to the best of my knowledge, they do not. Uh, if they do, somebody on Facebook correct me. What's the difference between a dishonorable and other than, other than honorable? So in order to receive a dishonorable discharge, the question, sorry, Facebook, the question is, what's the difference between an other than honorable and a dishonorable? A dishonorable literally means you have done something to dishonor the military. It, you have to do something pretty bad to get a dishonorable. For example, anybody here familiar with Bo Bergdahl? Yes? Okay. So Bo Bergdahl um, had some issues with his unit. He decided he was going to try and make an example of them by leaving his post and walking to another post. He got captured by the Taliban. He got a disarmable discharge after being technically a prisoner of war for five years. He messed up in a big way. That's a disarmable. Um, other than honorable, on the other hand, is you did something that was conduct unbecoming of a service member, and they don't want to go through the full military tribunal, they just want to get you out. A dishonorable has to receive court martial, absolutely. Other than honorable can be administrative. So they can just process the paperwork and call it a And it's up to the veteran or the service member in that moment to appeal. And he, has to, he or she has to appeal too a I think special court martial, if I'm not mistaken. Facebook, correct me if I'm wrong. There's some veterans on Facebook. I figured if I accidentally say something wrong, somebody on there will tell me I messed it up. So in the administrative discharge, it could be either getting benefits or some benefits or getting more. Yes, in the event of an administrative discharge, you can receive some, all, or none of your benefits. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that good, good question. So I think what you're talking about is when you've got a service member that's maybe got a clearance, yeah. top secret, mm -hmm. or higher, or something of the, of the like. If a military, a service member is not supposed to breach their clearance level. Anything technically that a military person, a service member says, should be able to be repeated because they shouldn't ever tell you anything that can't be repeated. Do people break the rule? Sure. Are they supposed to? No. Could it get them an administrative discharge? Yes. Could it get them a dishonorable discharge? Yes. Depending on the level of secrecy. 